Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And we're dinosaur enthusiasts who want to share our love of dinosaurs with everybody and talk about some fun dinosaur facts and interesting things that are discovered as they're discovered. So today our topic is going to revolve around the Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the most popular dinosaurs in modern culture. So we had a chance to interview Pete Larson, a paleontologist and president of the Black Hills Institute of Geological Research in South Dakota, which Garrett and I uh, were lucky enough to be able to visit when we drove across the country. Uh, And Pete Larson led the excavation of the T-Rex Sioux, who is the largest and most complete T-Rex found. The interesting thing about the Black Hills Institute, when we were driving through South Dakota, It was actually during the Sturgis motorcycle rally, and we had to park several blocks away from this place, and you're walking down the street, and you're looking for a museum. You're expecting a large building, you know, maybe some columns or something, or at least a big sign, and it's a very unassuming building. It used to be, I think, a gymnasium, and you go in, and it, it was like stepping into a different world from this crazy biker rally. So even though it was a small institute, uh, it was full of a ton of fossils and very helpful people willing to talk about dinosaurs all day long. So I really highly recommend going there if you get a chance and you're in South Dakota. (laughs) We were pleased to find out that some of the most well-known T-Rex fossils were found in the area around this Black Hills Institute in South Dakota and Wyoming, and they actually still have one on display there, which is really neat. And now here's our interview with Pete Larson. How did you decide to become a paleontologist? Well, I guess I was uh, fascinated uh, with fossils since I picked up my first fossil when I was about four. And here's a tooth. It was obviously a tooth, but it was black. Why was it black? (laughs) (laughs) And so I went into the local museum and a gal there by the name of June Seidner, who she and her husband own the museum. Uh, kind of took me under her wing and started teaching me about fossils and loaning me books, and I was hooked. I was all over from then on. <laughs> what is it about dinosaurs that you think fascinates you the most? I think paleontologists have what we call, the, what I like to call the Peter Pan syndrome. Um, we never really grew up. We're still those little kids who are fascinated by, 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 by dead things and by things that have been dead for a really long time, things that were, were real real and truly, really and truly monsters. <laughs> you know, fossils are fascinating, but dinosaurs are even even more fascinating. They're just something that's so, so strange your imagination because there's nothing really like them living today, even though we have some of their descendants in birds. There's no, no bird that weighs uh, 10 ton, you know. There's, there's a, <laughs> they just don't, uh, uh, they don't get that big anymore. And I think that then also you start getting into it, and it's just that, fascination with the world as a different place. You know, we become time travelers. We look at we uh, we look at things in, in, in a way that kind of opens opens our imagination in a way that very few other sciences allow you to do. Now of course there are things like astronomy where you can imagine what it's like to live on another planet and that. But but the, the, the cool thing here is we don't have to use it's not just all imagination. It's we have tons of evidence and and uh, lots and lots of places in the world where we can actually go and see that ancient life, and it's in what's what remains is what we call fossils. So mm-hmm. um, I think that for me, at least, it's that that fascination and, and looking at things like a kid. I mean, I just I never grew up. I'm I'm I'm, I'm a very lucky person. <laughs> <laughs> and what are some of your favorite types of dinosaurs? Do you have any favorites? Well, of course, T. Rex. And <laughs> right. <laughs> T. Rex and t- Tyrannosaurus. Um, was because that's what I studied. Plus, also, they're some of the most fascinating, very, very uh, derived animals um, with these little puny arms and and uh, big leg muscles that allow them to run really fast and these giant teeth that, that uh, wouldn't have to necessarily take bites out of anything. They could swallow quite a bit of stuff just whole. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, um, I mean, you know, just they're... they're uh, and and to, to think about the biomechanics of this animal... Uh, that is like nothing that's really on Earth today. Um, to, to try to understand how it moved, how fast it moved, how it uh, would capture its prey, um, you know, behavior. And, and we have some hints and clues in the fossil record. We have uh, scars on the bones where tendons attached muscles to bones, and and we can follow. 
follow those back by looking at modern animals so we can get some kind of an idea about, about the biomechanics and the physiology of these animals. But it's, there's still a lot of theorizing and, and, and even speculation that goes into it, you know, if this, then this follows sort of thing. So it's, it's just a, I don't know, it just keeps you thinking about things that uh, just the normal world doesn't, doesn't do in, in, in a way that these animals have so many unanswered questions. And I think that's what kind of keeps science going or scientists going, or the unanswered questions. You know, we could, maybe we can find the answer to this question. And then, of course, once you find the answer to that question, it raises 10 new questions. So it's a, a never-ending sequence that gets played out, which is, which is just, you know, just wonderful. So you don't think that all the questions will ever be answered? Well, science is not exact, especially observational science. In observational science, now, unlike mathematics, where we do know what the square root of 2 is, because we invented mathematics, but unlike math, although we, were, we invented mathematics through observation as well, uh, observing the, the natural natural world, but, but still, you know, I thought, for instance, that uh, we could determine, uh, there must be a way to determine the sex of a dinosaur, and I was particularly looking at Tyrannosaurus rex. I uh, came up with an idea based upon some work by other people like uh, Alfred Sherwin and Romer, and other people who had looked at modern animals, crocodilians, lizards, uh, mostly crocodilians, and had noticed that there seemed to be a difference in the shape and placement of the first chevron, the first hemo arch, which is a bone at the, that is on the underside of the tail, and the first one, which is one closest to the pelvis. So I went with that, I did a little bit of, with the few specimens we had, which are basically, there was one specimen that was Sue, it looked like it fit with that mold, but through more more specimens being found, and then, and then uh, me using that and, and actually publishing on it. When you pr- present a theory or a hypothesis, and you pr- and you turn it into a theory, and then you present that theory to the scientific community, the scientific community then their job is to falsify that to see if it is if they can make it as incorrect. You can't. It's 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 almost impossible to say something is true as we approach the truth, but it is possible to say that does not work. So a colleague of mine, Greg Erickson. And one of the students looked into this and then invited me in on the, on the project. And it turns out that my original hypothesis was incorrect. Mm. Uh, the chevron shape and placement have nothing to do with uh, the sex of the animal. It is somewhat random, so probably wouldn't work with dinosaurs as well. Uh, the, our, our model there were alligator Mississippi. Yes, it's, Greg is in Gainesville, Florida, so that was easy for him. He's got lots and lots of skeletons that have, have been sex. But there are other things that I've been working on. One is that uh, one thing I proposed quite a while ago, and Mary Schweitzer actually proved, was that medullary bone is sometimes preserved in a fossil. Medullary bone is present in today's birds only in females and only during ovulation. It is it is bone that is deposited in a, a very loose network within the medullary cavities of things like the femurs of birds. Uh, that bone. So the, the bird uses that when it's creating the eggshells. Eggshells are calcium carbonate, so it takes, and bone is hydroxyl apatite, it's, it's a good source of, of calcium. So she so uh, she was actually able to find a specimen of Tyrannosaurus rex, interestingly enough, that had medullary bone within the cavity of the femur that matched with medullary bone in extant birds. And she proved that one was female. And then from there, I've used that information looking at the I, I've used that information to to progress another part of my hypothesis, which was that birds of that meat eating dinosaurs, dinosaurs are called theropods, and their living relatives, birds, have similarities. Many birds have uh, you can actually weigh an adult bird and find out what sex it is. It's called uh, sexual size dimorphism. Now, that sexual size dimorphism may be in the case of something like an ostrich, where the male is, is larger than the female, or they may be the same thing. Or it may be, in the, as in the case of ancillary forms, which are ducks and geese, and, and almost all birds of prey, it turns out that the, the female is the heavier and the larger of the dinosaurs. And my speculation was that, like birds of prey, theropods probably that the female was this more robust form. To uh, test this, I measured the length and circumference of the femur, plotted it on a graph, up so that one axis is the length of the femur, one axis is the circumference of the femur. And T. rex and, and a number of other, at least tyrannosaur theropods, plot out in two divergent lines. So as the animal reaches maturity, they go into two different 
lines where you have one that has a, the femurs increase at about the same length, but one gets a much bigger girth. And my hypothesis is that that one with a bigger girth was the female. Mm -hmm. And when I plot the specimen that uh, Mary Schweitzer was able to show had medullary bone, it plotted in with the more robust forms, the bigger ones. So, so the biggest, uh, this my, my uh, theory from that then is that the biggest and baddest of all T-Rexes were females. And um, okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> to sort of show you what, uh, the line of, of reasoning that goes in. And so the, the way to falsify that then is to find a one with medullary bone that's in the, that's in the glacial group. There's other circumstantial evidence that, that makes me believe that, too, including the types of injuries to the tail, the tails of tyrannosaurs. Uh, there's a, the robust forms always seem to have injuries right at the base of the tail, which is possible during copulation that they're, because these are big animals, that they, there could be ligament tears, there could be broken bones, uh, there could be a number of different things can happen. So that also fits in with that pattern. So, and there's a couple of other things that are a little bit more detailed that also fit in with that pattern. Yeah, I have a few questions about T-Rex, since you're a, a T-Rex expert. So I've read a, a few different things. Uh, some people think T-Rex is more of a scavenger, and others think is more of a predator. Well, they're, they're both right. Large-bodied carnivores are, for the most part, there are very few obligate predators. Most of them will scavenge. If you've got a free male, there's no sense risking. Well, every time you're, you're hunting something, you're taking a big risk of, of injury uh, and a big rich, uh, risk of, of, of uh, unsuc you know, not being able to be successful in your hunt. So things like lions, hyenas, bears, dogs, wolves, uh, that whole group, uh, every, uh, all birds of prey, uh, and which includes also, of course, vultures, and that would, well, which, should, which are, have been, anyway, they're actually a group of storks, storks, many, many other birds also scavenge, who would actually hunt as well. The reason I think that we have good evidence to support that they did hunt, we have specimens that got away, a number of ductile dinosaurs and a number of triceratops that show healed injuries that could have only been inflicted by Tyrannosaurus rex, including a relatively recent specimen which uh, Robert De Palma, myself and others described recently, uh, I think it was in Plus One, where there was a two ductile tail vertebrae mm -hmm. that had fused together and in within within that fusion there was a broken off T Rex tooth. That they only could have gotten in it when the animal was alive because it actually that injury was healed. Mm -hmm. It got away. It got away. And unless somebody walked up to it, as Jack Horner suggested, well a T Rex probably just walked up to it, thought it was dying or dead, but it was actually asleep and it bit it and it ran away. Unless you have some rather silly <laughs> explanation for that. And there are, there's multiple evidence. That's the one we actually have a T-Rex tooth embedded in, but there's other multiple evidence of injuries, healed injuries that, that seem very clear they were inflicted by uh, the bite of the Tyrannosaurus rex. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, and there, uh, another bit of evidence, there are no large, large body obligate scavengers existing today. Why would we think there would be some in the past? Okay. You know, there are only certain number of niches, uh, biological niches that can be, can be filled. The, uh, on land, the only the closest thing to an obligate scavenger we have are a group called vultures, which are related to storks, not related to eagles and stuff. Well, related to eagles because they're birds, but, but <laughs> um, vultures. But even vultures, when they're hungry, will kill things. And um, the argument was made that, well, vultures have a really ex uh, extremely good sense of smell. Actually, no bird has a really good sense of smell. The turkey vulture is really the only vulture that has a good sense of smell. But we don't, you don't need a good sense of smell to smell something dead. And, and, and most scavenging occurs before the carcass is rotting. So, you know, that's, that's a kind of a, not a very good argument that just because T-Rex had a really, really excellent sense of smell. Dogs, on the other, on the other hand, have probably the best sense of smell of any mammal, uh, the group of called, called dogs, and they use that sense of smell to hunt prey. Mm -hmm. They also love to roll in dead things. <laughs> but they use and, and things like hyenas, which are thought to have been scavengers, uh, actually kill more of their prey even than lions do. So there's no there's no um, you know no set pattern of obligate scavenging in, in, in any extant forms. Why would there be a fossil one? Right, that makes sense. And then when you say T. Rex, then all of their kin. So all of those animals then would have, you know they're all scavengers. I don't think so. There wouldn't be enough stuff to eat if you just waited for them to die. You know, when you're when you're hungry, when you're hungry, you'd go out and kill something. They did. They would scavenge. There's no reason to assume they wouldn't scavenge, but they did. That's they were they were also active predators. 
did they tend to stick together in groups, or were they more solo? We have, for T-Rex, we have some evidence. Some of their relatives, it might have a thing called Albertosaurus on Dry Island in, in uh, Alberta, they found evidence of eight of those animals together. Uh, that's a Tyrannosaur closely related to T-Rex. It's a little bit earlier, a little bit smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, but with T-Rex, we also have, there's there are three instances where more than, parts of more than one, uh, actually, Four instances, three, four instances where more than one uh, individual has been reported being found together. So uh, it seems likely that they perhaps hunted in groups, whether it was a family group or, or something on that order. Uh, we don't know. I've speculated it might be a family group. Okay. So smaller groups, though, not big groups. And and uh, other evidence for other tyrannosaurs, like Nanotyrannus, we find uh, sites where there are 30 or more Nanotyrannus teeth at, uh, at one kill site, one feeding site, and, and one animal couldn't lose 30 teeth in one feeding. What's a typical day like for you? Summer or winter? In the winter, I'm usually in the lab and mounting dinosaurs or in the office working on contracts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, um, also, we do, we used to do a number of trade shows. We're down to kind of one now, so the Tucson Gym and Mineral Show we do. We're there for about two weeks and where we set up an exhibit and talk to people and sell stuff and that sort of thing. In the summer, I'm, I'm out in the field a lot. Mm-hmm. So I'm out looking, looking for dinosaurs as well as digging them up. So I have a couple questions about the Black Hills Institute specifically. I know that you guys are, are responsible for probably most of the T-Rex casts in museums around the world. So what are some of the more famous ones? Oh, let's see. We have, there's one at the Smithsonian Institution. There's where the, we have one at Manchester University. We have a number of different museums in Japan. Mm-hmm. We have, well, I'm just trying, there's, there's like, trying to remember, more than 50 skeletons. In fact, how about, how many skeletons? Stan skeletons are there out there, 50 some? More? 50, 50 some plus, plus then we have several skeletons of a, a T Rex called Bucky. So Stan and, Stan and Bucky are the two. <laughs> we have, there's, there's, uh, let's see, the Children's Museum in Indianapolis, the Houston Museum of Nature, Nature and Science. There's some of the other U.S. ones. I don't know why my brain isn't working too well today, but let's see, we have one in Spain, we have one in Italy, there's one in Leiden, Holland. There's a couple in Korea also, at least one in Seoul, Korea, and then another one or two. Wow. There's one in the, uh, one or, there's two actually in the National Museum in, in Tokyo, National Museum in Japan. Mm-hmm. There's there's one in Gunma Prefecture Museum, there's one in Fukui, there's one in Osaka, I believe. There's just kind of all over. There's are big band skeletons. Do, do these museums contact you and say, we want... A cast, or how does that work? Pretty much, yeah. It's a, uh, through word of mouth, or we, we have a website, too, like at uh, bhigr.com. Mm-hmm. And we, um, uh, so it's mostly word of mouth is how museums find out about us. Is the museum making these casts pretty regularly? Yes, we have, uh, we have right now something around 20-some people. We've had as many as 35, maybe Mm-hmm. And it depends on the, the the last recession kind of cut. We had to cut back a bit, but uh, things are getting better now. And so we, we, you know, we're doing, you know, even now we're doing several T-Rex skeletons here. We're just doing one now for a museum in China. What's the process for creating a cast? The process is, is of course, you have to have a skeleton to mold. So the, the, first of all, you, you have to prepare a T-Rex skeleton and then create the molds so you can make uh, basically clones of the bones. Mm-hmm. Those molds, then you have to pour casts, and we use polyurethane and polyurethane foaming and non-foaming resins, so they're plastic. Mm-hmm. We also then have to create internal steel frameworks, so there's drilling and sometimes cutting of the cast bones, not, not original bones, but the cast bones, to, to uh, put the steel in to support the, to support the bones. Mm-hmm. And then in order to, uh, there's a design phase where you work with the museum, that comes up with a pose, and, and we make sure that it is. We, we do the engineering of it, but they try to come up with an idea for the pose, which we either 
suggest a, a, a few different possibilities or they come up with something that we work together to make sure they're, that it is physiological, physiologically possible for the animal to do that they're, what they're asking. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the mounting takes place where we create that armature. Uh, each of those mounts have to be done in a modular fashion because they're mounted here at the Institute and then shipped to the museum. Mm -hmm. Once they're done, uh, they're, they're, once the mount is, is done, we, we have to do some uh, basically filling of places where we've had to cut the bones apart and, and you know, just basically kind of making the, making it look nice again so there's no screw holes and stuff and things. And then, and then the, the entire specimen is, is, is painted to look like the original bone. Mm -hmm. And then the specimen is created, which is also, we have to create brackets, mounting brackets for each of the pieces, the individual pieces of the dinosaur mm -hmm. that are then put in crates and the crates are shipped out. And then we have, we create a video. Most of the museums are able to mount them themselves. Uh, sometimes they ask for one or more of us to go and help, but usually the, they're pretty straightforward and they can actually put them together. Uh, if we do a mount, once we have the specimen at the museum and uncreated, it takes about an hour and put it up. What happens once you've made the mold with the actual bones? What happens to the, the real bones afterwards? The real bones for Stan are in our museum here mm -hmm. at uh, Michael's Institute. So we have a museum where that's the original time exhibit for people to come see. The original of Bucky was sold to the Children's Museum in Indianapolis, so they have the original in Indianapolis. Mm. That's also available for for people to see. So the original is then uh, eventually mounted and, and um, uh, we also have another one, Wiring Story, which the original, we sell cast up, but the original is at the museum in, in, in Houston. Mm -hmm. So going back to uh, T-Rexes real quick, what kind of parent were they? Like I, I know, I heard, or I read somewhere like herbivores like Triceratops may have attacked the babies so that then Maybe that as a result they were more nurturing parents, but... If we look at birds of prey, that's probably our best example. Uh, birds of prey will take care of their, their chicks up to a certain point. It's a very strenuous part of their life, which is why it takes both of them to do that, and which, since we're finding multiple sites with multiple T-Rexes, I'm thinking that there's a good chance that they also have parental care, and they stay together because of that parental care. Mm -hmm. um, there's no... We, and we also have found, you know, smaller parts of smaller T-Rexes with the bigger T-Rexes, which shows that they were at least together during their time of death, which indicates that they could potentially and very likely were together as they died together as well. So it's, uh, I think they have parental care. That's something that's very difficult to prove conclusively, but there is some circumstantial evidence that indicates that they, they probably did have some sort of parental care. Oh, plus, plus meat-eating dinosaurs, theropod dinosaurs, mm -hmm. um, the ones where we found nests. We've also found, in some instances, parents sitting, incubating the eggs, sitting on the nest. So that's parental care before birth also. Just theropods? No other types? There's some indication that other groups perhaps had parental care as well because of hatchlings hanging around the nest for a while. Um, that's some of Jack Horner's stuff, some of Jack Horner's work. How do you feel about... Movies that feature dinosaurs and like like Jurassic Park and it does it. Is there a lot of stuff that's kind of inconsistent with what science has found to be true? Well, in in um, <laughs> movies are movies. I love the fact that we can look at these animals as living individuals. Movies are able to through CGI produce the most convincing and I think very realistic and very probably mimics what the dinosaurs themselves were like. Itch. You know, again, that's the Peter Pan syndrome. Let's see. Oh, for uh, Triceratops, I had, I know there's like been reports maybe that was ac it actually was a juvenile uh, Taurosaurus. Is there any evidence yet, or if it was an actual... I think there's a number of papers now. A lot of people are working on this. It's a, it was a good question. You know, it's always good to, to ask a question. That's what a, you know, a possible scenario uh, uh, for propose a hypothesis. And so what Jack Horner and John uh, Scan, uh, Scan uh, what's his last, last name, anyway, what they proposed was was quite quite a probable scenario that definitely needs to be investigated. I think, I do not agree with their conclusion. I don't believe that Taurosaurus was actually an adult Triceratops hortus. There's a lot of reasons for that, many of which are published. We've collected a lot of Triceratops. And the 
morphology of torosaurus is very different than the skulls, very different than the, than, than the, the skulls of Triceratops Hopsidae. You only get eight torosaurus, more or less, but there, there are also partial torosaurus that are much smaller. We have a, a subadult here. It's about a little bit bigger than a, than a standard full adult Triceratops horridus. Triceratops horridus, at a much smaller size, um, has a very coarse and rough texture to the bones. Younger ones are smooth. Torosaurus, in this one, which this, the, the, the tor texture of this Torosaurus skull, well, by the way, and all Torosaurus skulls do the same thing. They get that rare coarse texture. But mm -hmm. this particular Torosaurus skull, which is seven feet long as opposed to a normal six and a half foot long Triceratops horridus skull, very smooth texture. There's, there's lots of very detailed characters, uh, anatomical differences that uh, separate them, including the shape of the mass of the shape of the nasals, premaxilla, very different premaxilla. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just a number of characters. It just, it's just, you have to change all this stuff. And why do you have this, this adult texture on these animals, which are supposedly still growing and going to grow another, like, the biggest horse or skull is like nine feet long. It's huge. Or mm -hmm. triceratops, or it is only going to be six and a half. Maybe it's close, maybe, maybe might make seven feet long, but I've never seen them quite seven feet long. I know you were part of a dig that involved, I think it was what, three triceratops in Wyoming last year? Yeah, there's, yep, there's actually four. And okay. Going back to the site, we, we, um, we're, it's a big site, so we were not able to get it finished unless we had a T-Rex dig and stuff, so we weren't able to get as much stuff done as we yeah. had hoped. So you have to wait till summer? We'll be back out there, we'll be back out there in, in May. May. Um, well, it's interesting because there's really no, there's, these animals... Uh, because there's some partial articulation and things there, and the bones are very concentrated in, a, in a, an area that's a 30 meters long by at least 20 meters wide, and it's probably 30 meters wide also, or maybe bigger. They obviously died together, that's lived, lived together. Now, tri Triceratops has been known, Triceratops has been known from usually, in fact, up until this time, only single specimens. There have been a couple of occurrences where through stream aggregation through just plain accumulation of bones. There have been parts of more than one found in certain areas, but they were not anywhere near complete animals. They were pretty clearly washed into place that so that, uh, you know, they, they we can't say that they lived together. So it was always thought that Triceratops was isolated, just plain lived by themselves. So this is interesting because there's four different sizes, two adults, one's just a little bit smaller than the other, a sub-adult, and one that almost, you could almost call a juvenile, small enough. Those animals represent three different age groups. So what are they doing together? I don't know. But it raises some possibilities. Okay, maybe family group for protection. Because if you have more than one triceratops, there's been some wonderful artwork where people have, you know, you had T-Rexes and they, they form a circle, you know, pull the wagons into a circle and ward off the T-Rexes. You know, one, one possibility is safety in numbers. I don't think they ever form very large herds because we have seen bone beds, like some of the ceratops in bone beds in Canada and the Duffel bone beds both in Canada and here in the United States and other places in Duffel Lines, there's all kind of slowly fine bone beds where they have hundreds of and sometimes thousands of individuals together. Yeah. Never found anything like that for Triceratops, so it seems unlikely they were hurt when they had giant hurt. But this adds a different, a sort of a, a, a brand new bit of information which, which changes our ideas on what Triceratops were like. It seems like a lot of our perceptions of how dinosaurs behaved and even looked like and stuff have changed a lot in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Does that, is it, all, is it always changing so much? The change that's happened in the last 20 years, I think, was brought about by a renewed interest in dinosaurs the last 20, 30 years. Jurassic mm -hmm. Park was helpful in that. Back in the 70s, actually it's probably 40 years, the last 40 years, We've had a dinosaur renaissance that has been fed by the movies. The movies have kept the public interested because the public's interested. Um, it helps scientists who make discoveries to let the public know that those discoveries are being made because it, it helps keep the interest in dinosaurs going. Because of that, people are more likely to actually get out in the field and want to make some discoveries. So the museums are, are very interested in their staff in some instances. To have a strap <laughs> mm -hmm. to uh, try to you know get publicity. Get people who come to museums, so they want to have uh, have dinosaurs coming there, which is what helps our business, of course. But it also means that scientists' interest, because the interest in dinosaurs is up, scientists are able to get funding for their work. And so this has been a really good thing. Jurassic Park movies have been good for everybody. Not only does it get uh, people like me, give people like me the opportunity to see what. Dinosaurs in the flesh, so to speak. 
<laughs> not just in my mind, but on the screen. It gives the public that, uh, that um, opportunity. And because the public has that opportunity, they're able, uh, they, they keep their interest, you know, because there's something new they're learning. So we have places like Liaoning in China, this wonderful lake deposit, which has produced all of these feathered dinosaurs and, and just and as, as, as doubled in some ways a, a lot of the information about the ecology and the amount of the animals that were around at the beginning of the Cretaceous. So they both feed each other. You now the more discoveries are made, the more money is available for discoveries, which then makes discoveries more possible to be made. And because there's so little we know about these animals, I mean, we have, you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of dinosaur species that have yet to be discovered. There are times where geologic times that are not well preserved in the fossil record or are preserved in areas that are very remote uh, that people have not yet explored. So, you know, everybody, paleontologist, wants to be making discoveries to help justify their existence, to help uh, bring in funding, mm -hmm. and to help so they can go back in the field again. So all of this is not just self-serving, it's self-feeding, and it is self-perpetuating. It is something that allows this this uh, business of, of finding dinosaurs and describing dinosaurs and putting dinosaurs in museums, it helps to fund that. So what what is a typical dinosaur dig like? Not like a Jurassic Park. <laughs> so typically you're away from, you're camping out because you're, not only because it's, it's nice to just get out and camp out, but you're camping out because you're away from town, you're out in the boonies, you're out where uh, on, the, uh, on the badlands out where the, the ground is eroding. If you're in the west, generally or in a country like Mongolia, you have to take all your stuff with you. You can maybe make a trip into town once in a while, but you can't go in every night and have and stay in the hotel and have your dinner at um, a local restaurant. There's some people who do that, but it's expensive, and besides, it's much more fun just to be out the field. <laughs> um, so we you know, need to get up early. You may have to not off for a few hours during the afternoon because it gets too hot. Because out here in the west, it can be in the summer, easily over 100 degrees. We have bad storms that can come through. We get most of our rains through thunderstorms. Most of our moisture through thunderstorms. They can go right past you. They can go right through you. You have sometimes very little time to cover up your site. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, it's not advisable to cover up the site either. But it could be rained in. If you have, especially working in the spring, it could be rained in for days at a time where you can't do anything. If you're lucky if you have cell service. In the old days, we had no self-service cars, but not all our sites. In fact, most of them don't have self-service, so we have to go up on top of the hill and make a phone call, which is okay. Uh, being away from the telephone and computers can be a really good thing after a while. <laughs> so how do you determine where to dig? You have to see something on the surface. There's, you can dig a hole anywhere you want, and the chances of finding a dinosaur bone are about as close to zero as anything could possibly be, <laughs> even if you're in the right kind of rock. So you have to see something exposed on the surface. And that, in the Hell Creek Formation where we were, um, it's usually tiny fragments of bone, which vary from the rock and the, the dirt by color and texture, usually. If they don't vary, you're not going to see them. <laughs> and so you then uh, have to be able to identify what you're looking at, especially they're almost always just fragments what uh, kind of animal it's from, whether it's a meat-eating dinosaur, a plant-eating dinosaur, or a dinosaur at all, and hopefully you could look at it and uh, find a piece that will help to tell the species or tell you that it might be something new. And then you follow those pieces back up, up the hill to try to find where they're coming from. Sometimes you can find where they're coming from, sometimes you can't. Uh, even if you dig a big trench, you still may not find where it's coming from. But uh, in the case of big dinosaurs like Q-Bex, you can usually find where they're coming from and, and then you begin your excavation. You, you look at the uh, geology and determine what your chances are, you know, which you can see what the stream flow direction to see what might have moved, what bones might have moved. In the Creek Formation, most of the dinosaurs we find are disarticulated, which means the bones are not together as they were when the animal was living, but they're somewhat scattered. And so you have to, well, you can occasionally find an articulated specimen. It's very rare. Um, and then, so you have to have a plan of digging. You have to take the overburden off first because you, you want to be able to move forward uh, quickly once you start uncovering the bones because the longer those bones lay, uh, lay out, once their surface is uncovered, the more chance of damage both from you just walking across or, you know, bumping or falling down or, or a cow coming at night and walking across it or a rainstorm or just the wind blowing and blowing little pieces away. You have to, have to lose the bones as we're... Uh, as they're uncovered, mm -hmm. and uh, multiple
multiple times uh, using sanorac like glues and using things like polyvinyl acetate to help um, create a kind of protective coating on the bones, and then we then we dig around them and, and get them into the small uh, into smaller bundles and and uh, put field jackets on them, uh, protecting the bones with aluminum foil first, and we're going to flip the jackets over and take them out. That sounds very complicated, but. <laughs> not quite rocket science, but you, you have to have, it takes, the, the biggest aid is experience, first in recognizing what you're looking at, figuring out which, how you're going to excavate it, and, um, you know, having, having experience is the only way you can learn that you can't learn that in school. When you go out on digs, is it typically with people who are pretty experienced? Yes. I mean, we do have volunteers also, most, many of our volunteers have had quite a bit of experience somebody new that wants to learn, or maybe even a master student or something like that that wants to come and learn how to how to do their job. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's it's a it's a process that uh, takes you know the longer you do it, the more you do it, the better you are at it. The better your 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 the more your guesses turn into uh, something a, a reasonable hypothesis rather than just pure speculation. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so. You know, it's, it's like anything, the more you do it, the better you are. Conversely, if you have someone who's learned in some of the old, old school methods of doing things and are not willing to change or to try new methods, you also, it's very important to, to have an open mind, to try to find always better ways to do things. And if you have somebody that's set in their ways, they don't make a good fossil hunter. They don't make a good fossil digger because they're going to make the same mistakes over and over and over again, and I'm going to learn from them. So you have to have someone with a certain, uh, they have to be flexible, and they have to be artistic. They have to be able to have a, have a an imagination to kind of project to see underground without the aid of, of an x-ray or anything else like that to try to, for, uh, I don't want to try to write the right word here, to try to predict what you're going to find and how it's going to be laying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you make, make you you know, no, you'll never know until you dig it up, but you can have a pretty good idea of what's going on um, if you have enough experience at this, and you know what to do. And each each fossil is, is an entity to itself, and it has certain uh, there are certain things about it that are unique to that fossil that you have to be able to incorporate into your understanding of what's going on. You know, you want to be always watching for soft tissue preservation, which is very rare occurrence, but does happen, mm-hmm. and you can miss it if you don't have that. How would you treat it if you found something with some soft tissue? Uh, you treat it differently. You don't um, the, soft, the portion that shows soft tissue. You do not you do not want to use any conservation medium on it unless there is no other way to save it. And if you're saving, you still even if you have to use a conservation media on on most of it to save it, you want to make sure that there are areas that you do not use that conservation media on it because in order to Study soft tissue. One of the things we need to do is we need to preserve the chemistry of that. Um, there are still proteins that are preserved in some of these fossils that, if you start adding chemicals to it, that you can alter. You can alter those proteins, or you can introduce proteins. You know, if I lose something and hold the piece of it with my with my with my with my finger, and then I pull my finger away, of course I'm going to leave some of my skin there. You're adding, you know, you're adding genetic material. And you, know, you just have to be very, very cautious. In fact, even just touching things and stuff. If you're if, if you're taking samples that will be used later, then you just have to look ahead, think ahead to uh, preserving the chemist, chemical integrity of that specimen as well. For new species that are discovered, I guess this I thought of this because I saw the the hadrosaur, the first hadrosaur fossil found in New Jersey, and I know it's in um, I think Philadelphia somewhere now. But it um, it was interesting because they only found a couple large bones, and yet they were able to figure out what the whole dinosaur probably looked like. So I was just wondering how how do you figure that out? Had the sort of foci, which is the one you're talking about, actually had quite a bit there. There was, um, they had a, I think a little skull, not much, but they had quite a, you know, sort of representative bones from the, the, the legs and arms and things and, and vertebrae and ribs and things. And, um, of course, the, the original picture has been altered substantially as to what they thought. They, and they were comparing it to 
some dinosaurs that were found earlier uh, in in Europe, these uh, the Guanodons, so some of the early English and uh, Belgium dinosaurs. But it was the uh, yeah that's the first dinosaur described from North America. Right. Um, and and it's uh, so and if if you look it's it's, it's really fascinating to look back in the the old literature and look at restorations that people have done and look at the old ancient artwork and how it's changed. You know, you can see you can see the advancement of science in that art. I guess if you were to discover a new species today, but you only had a couple of fossils, one or two maybe, you would just base what you thought the whole thing looked like on based on similar dinosaurs that you already know exist. Sort of, yeah. If you just find a few parts, and you can uh, because you know of the relationships of dinosaurs, it's it's not a a, a big stretch of the imagination when you when you use them to compare to try to, to reconstruct what's what's the rest of it. You know, if it's a Ceratopsian dinosaur, there are some there are many clues in the skeleton that you don't have to have a whole skeleton before you know approximately what the whole animal's going to look like. But you're not going to get everything right because you don't have enough data. But you're going to get you know the general body shape that uh, you can figure out the size, a potential weight of that animal. You can figure out what they're uh, if you don't have a skull. You can know approximately what that skull is going to look like, uh, although you may, you know, you, you, if it's a horned dinosaur, you may choose the wrong model from the horned dinosaurs, <laughs> um, unless you've gotten at least some hints as to what you're looking at. But, but so, it, you know, there's, it's, it's a, uh, that's almost more of an interpolation rather than a, an extrapolation, because we have that tree of life, which we are constantly adding to, that help us to understand the position that this particular species uh, the position that it, it, uh, uh, that, it, that it fit into in that tree of life. And so that also uh, that allows us to then uh, try to understand more about behavior and all of this, even because of the work that's been done on their relatives. So there's a lot that's, that can be done, even with very fragmentary fossils. So, oh, I guess going back to how our perceptions of dinosaurs have changed so much in the last a couple decades, I've been reading things like uh, maybe we could, we could figure out what the colors some of them were, and there's the whole thing about the feathers, but now there was a recent article that I think came out that said that they were probably mostly scaly and only a few were feathers. What um, what are your thoughts on how dinosaurs looked? Well, the, you know, we have to go to the evidence we have. And um, uh, theropod dinosaurs, probably most of them had feathers, if not through their entire life, certainly when they were young. Uh, feathers came about for insulation, were useful for insulation. Uh, it just turned out that uh, the structure was also conducive to flight. <laughs> I mean, you know, flight, flight feathers from those earlier things. We're, uh, I'm working right now with a project that actually began in Mount Interest University has joined with uh, working at the Kansas Leader Accelerator Center where we're looking at the chemistry over the surface area, the, the actual element, elemental distribution over surface area of fossils that we're scanning in the synchrotron there and using high energy x-rays. And so we're actually able to map the distribution of the elements across the face of the fossil. This has allowed us to uh, do uh, and, and publish on uh, color of feathers um, and color in skin um, in certain instances and prove that uh, the textures or the, uh, what am I trying to say, the, uh, what we see in terms of three-dimensionality of the fossils in the microscopic level where it appeared that uh, eumelanin and ferromelanin were preserved, but they looked like modern ferromelanin and eumelanin, but we were able to prove that they actually are. And so that, that actually, uh, you know, in addition to the work that, that we have done on colors just using this, it also then uh, bolsters uh, work by other scientists who are working on that on, on that same that same thing. Now, Ordovician dinosaurs and Cirrusian dinosaurs are quite separated from each other. So the only instance we have of any of the ornithischians having something that might resemble feathers uh, is a specimen of Cetacosaurus from the ending China. That Cetacosaurus is a relative of the Ceratopsian dinosaurs, so it's related to Triceratops. Uh, that Cetacosaurus that is preserved there is uh, has on its back, it has nice skin preservation, but it has apparently a rising out of little bumps on the, quote, scales, which uh, I guess scales or tubercles, whatever you want to call them, uh, are these long hair-like projections. We used that, to, we found the first triceratops skin where we have a good portion of the skin over the entire body of the animal represented. Uh, that specimen, the original is that we used to be of uh, uh, natural science now. We have, a, uh, we have a lot of the skin here because we're still working on it, still getting ready to publish on it. But the, the skin, that skin had these bumps or almost nipple-like projections from from the, t the top surface of some of the scales. And so, looking at that 
Archosaurus and going back to the Triceratops, Triceratops could have actually had almost quill-like projections coming out, they, which they might have been able to raise for the muscles in their skin to make them look larger to ward off uh, T-Rex, who obviously, because we only find partial skeletons of Triceratops, thought Triceratops was quite tasty. <laughs> anyway, so, so it's, you know, the more we, more specimens we find, the more, the other thing is there's more skin on more dinosaurs than what anybody ever thought possible. People clean it away. They don't recognize that it's there. That soft tissue also, that the, the envelope of skin also probably preserves uh, uh, some muscle, uh, muscle and tendon and ligament evidence that we do not yet have the ability to identify uh, we're close. Uh, I think that what we're doing is is uh, is something that will be able to be used for that. That'll be part of our uh, part of our way of finding using the synchrotron and, and the high energy X rays to map the, the elements. That will help us. That will be the biggest help in, in, in finding those things. But seeing them by eye, you're just missing them because they're they're part of the fabric of the of the matrix of the of the rock that they're buried in now. And so I think we're going to as time goes on. That's one of the really exciting areas. Soft tissue preservation is far, far greater than what we ever thought. And the preservation of, of biomolecules within the bones themselves is also very, very much, much uh, more of that is, is, is present than what we ever thought possible. It, it just seems like paleontology, uh, you know, there's all this awesome stuff, and uh, like you said, the kind of get to be like a little a kid but there's also seems to be a lot of controversy with the the bone wars and then um i just read about tinker the t-rex and then of course what happened with with sue like your passion is very obvious and it's really cool to uh talk to you about this stuff and i'm just wondering what, like what kind of what drives you to, to keep on studying it despite all the battles and controversies well i'm not gonna let somebody's bad behavior ruin my life <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna uh, keep on doing what I love to do, and no one's gonna stop me. There's um, uh, just, a, just for your information, there's a, one of, there's a, a movie that is premiering actually Thursday at uh, uh, Sundance, a documentary on the whole suit thing mm-hmm. called Dinosaur 13. So that, that kind of, if you want, if you really, if you get a chance to see that, there's also we have uh, my, uh, uh, one of my ex-wives and I uh, wrote a book called Rex Appeal. That'll tell, that'll tell you a whole mess about what happened. It's an interesting story, but uh, uh, I have I'm I'm probably the luckiest person in the, in the in the universe. I get to do what I love, and, and I have all kinds of people who care about me and support the, what we do, including people in museums all over the world. And do you have any advice for people who are amateurs interested in paleontology? Well, I guess you know, uh, pursue your love. You know, if you if you have an interest in paleontology, then you should try to find a. a Try to find a way that you can somehow do it. You know, is there a uh, possibility of collecting in your area? Is there are there museums in the area that you could do some volunteering at? Are uh, are there books that you uh, you know that uh, you'd like to uh, you know to check and see what books are available? There's wonderful books on paleontology now. Some really fantastic dinosaur uh, books on dinosaurs and that sort of thing that, that are for uh, a whole. Uh, the whole gamut of, of, of how far you are as an amateur, whether you're a six-year-old who just picked up your first fossil or you're 98 years old and, and uh, uh, just want to read something about uh, about uh, dinosaurs but don't really want to go in the field <laughs> and everything in between. And so, you know, I would I would recommend that if you if there's something that you, you love to do, you should try to do it, whether you can do it as, as, as a hobby or, or as a profession. You know, that's up to you, but you should try to... You know, life is short. Life is really, really short. So do fun stuff. That's good advice. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Thanks, Peter. Nice, nice to meet you over the phone. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Pete Larson's story of how he discovered Sue, along with several other paleontologists, is outlined in the story Dinosaur 13, which was recently released in theaters. And it details the entire excavation process the federal government's seizure of Sioux, which is a whole other story, and the 10-year-long legal battle and how Black Hills came together, the city of Black Hills, that is, came together to fight for her and how Pete Larson eventually ended up in prison, unfortunately. And since this podcast has been focusing on Tyrannosaurus Rex, 
We came up with a list of interesting facts that you may or may not know about this giant dinosaur. So starting out simply, a lot of people know Tyrannosaurus rex means tyrant lizard in ancient Greek, and that obviously comes from the time when we still thought dinosaurs were lizards. And they're actually, for those that don't know, considered reptiles because reptiles are not specific to a um, species or a family. It has to do with how they look and how they act. So birds and non-avian dinosaurs can also be considered reptiles along with lizards. It's a different kind of classification. T-Rex lived during the late Cretaceous period and they were among the last non-avian dinosaurs uh, before the Great Extinction. They lived in western North America at the time it was an island continent called uh, Laramidia and they're one of the largest known land predators. They were 40 feet in length 13 feet tall at the hips, and they weighed about 6.8 metric tons. As Pete Larson mentioned in the interview, a lot of scientists now think that it was a predator and a scavenger, because if we look at modern animals, you'll see that the real big predators don't necessarily have to hunt for their food. If something smaller kills it and they just want to go eat it, they can just come up and take it, which takes a lot less energy than trying to go out and hunt for all your food. If you're big and scary, you can just take it from the little guys. So that's probably what T-Rex did. It wouldn't have made a lot of sense for him to do all the hunting by himself. I don't know what I'm saying, he. <laughs> it's mean. <laughs> T-Rex is estimated to be capable of exerting one of the largest bite forces among all terrestrial animals. Scientists used to think T-Rex walked upright and dragged its tail, looking like a living tripod. Uh, and in 1915, convinced that the T-Rex stood upright, Henry Fairfield Osborne, the former president of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, further reinforced this notion by unveiling the first complete Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton arranged walking upright. And it stood in this upright pose for 77 years until it was finally dismantled in 1992 and put in the correct position. I always think of Barney and some of these other cartoony dinosaurs when they talk about how T-Rex didn't actually stand upright and you'll still see depictions of this by people that don't understand dinosaurs <laughs> with them with their upright position but when you take a closer look at the hips of the T-Rex you can tell that it was set up for walking um, with its body parallel to the ground which is much more efficient and on top of that the the massive length of the T-Rex, like we mentioned, 40 feet in length, if it's standing upright, the heart has to pump much harder to get the blood up to its head, and other things make it more difficult to stand upright. So standing parallel to the ground is really the way to go. So in the Jurassic Park movies, they've got it right, uh, the way they depicted how T-Rex stood with its tail off the ground, uh, but one thing that they got wrong was that the T-Rex would definitely have been able to see you even if you stood still. Yeah, T-Rex had a large part of its brain dedicated to vision and it had excellent binocular vision. Both of its eyes face forward on front of its head. So the notion that it used smell like it did in the movie to find people or could only see them if they were moving is just for cinematic effect really. T-Rex shared the heightened sensory abilities of Silurosauria, heightened relative rapid and coordinated eye and head movements, as well as an enhanced ability to sense low frequency sounds that would allow a Tyrannosaurus to track prey movements from long distances. They did have an enhanced sense of smell, uh, may have been comparable to modern vultures which use scent to track carcasses for scavenging and research on the olfactory bulbs shown that Tyrannosaurus rex had the most highly developed sense of smell of 21 sampled non-avian dinosaur species. One very interesting thing to me is how predators versus herbivores would raise their young. There's a lot of evidence to show that herbivores kind of raise their young the way sea turtles did if you've ever seen those videos where they go they lay a bunch of eggs and they kind of run away. Not quite that severe but once they're hatched, they're pretty much on their own. It's kind of a numbers game where you try to have as many kids as possible, hoping that the species continues. 
So Tyrannosaurus rex, um, there's a lot of evidence to show that they would raise just one young, teach them everything they knew about how to hunt and raise them from a young age up until they could hunt on their own. And they had to protect their young as well from herbivores and other animals that would see them as a threat and want to kill them off. So in a really weird way, T-Rex was a much more nurturing parent than a lot of herbivores would have been at the time. So going along with their nurturing parenting behavior, they also may have fought in packs or hunted in packs. Obviously, the, those kind of go hand in hand if you know how to raise your young and interact with other generations, you might as well work together to make things easier for you in a hunt. And T-Rex probably also had feathers, at least on parts of its body. Yeah, when we were in Dinosaur National Monument, which is this really neat museum that spans the Colorado-Utah border, they have a couple points where they talk about dinosaurs with feathers, and I'd like to imagine the T-Rex being covered in black feathers and looking like a giant evil raven or something like that. <laughs> and I could imagine that being much more terrifying if it could ruffle its feathers and look that much bigger than if it was just a scaly green <laughs> creature. That would be terrifying. <laughs> and the fun fact of the day is the time between when a stegosaurus roamed the earth and when a T-Rex roamed the earth is actually longer between when the T-Rex roamed the Earth and today. So, to put it another way, dinosaurs have been around, were around for a time period longer than dinosaurs went extinct to today. So, most people know that humans are just a little blip on the geological time scale, but dinosaurs actually took up a pretty good chunk. They were so dominant for such a long time and so well adapted. It's very, very amazing. And it always reminds me, too, of these movies where you see the stegosaurs and the, you know, brachiosaurs and the tyrannosaurs and all these dinosaurs as if they were all around at the same time. And you might as well just throw some humans in there because that would make about as much sense. On that note, this concludes our first episode of I Know Dino. You can learn more about dinosaurs at our website, inodino.com. And join us for future podcasts. We have other interviews with some really interesting paleontologists. We're planning on releasing more episodes bi-weekly, but we'll see how things go. <laughs> maybe more often, maybe less often. Might not be a regular schedule. But thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. 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 We'll talk to you soon.